I want to just start by finishing up with um, some of the groups that we didn't hear from. Um, if you have your notes from Monday and you remember what group you're in, um, please share group four. What are some examples of yes, no arguments? You know, like these binary arguments where there's no middle ground. Um, and what are some problems with yes, no arguments? Group four? All right, um, I can talk for group four. From the article that I pulled out, um, some of the arguments she brings up is there's like an activity that involves, um, like she mentions gun control and like abortions. And I think there's one other thing, but she says like, it's examples where they're framed in like either guns everywhere or no guns. And those are like the only two options. And she's saying like, that's problematic because there's other options in the middle in between, like saying like some guns are like restrictions for like different kinds of things. And she said the same with like um, an environmentalist being like, assuming they're pro every type of um, environmentally friendly aspect when they could be against like one specific recycling program. And those like the, Pro environments are absolutely against it, and how there's like stuff in the middle that they're ignoring. Middle of it. Yeah, and if if we only have, you know, like all guns, no guns, you know, like then there is no in between. But there, if we listen to each other and each other's goals, um, we actually can learn something, solve problems, which is her is is her point um my my students often talk about presenting both sides of an argument and i always challenge them you know like there's more than two sides of an argument there are many aspects many perspectives and we should listen to as many as we possibly can really really listen to each other um group number five I asked you to analyze this quotation. It's a super complex quotation. Um, what did you come up with? Sorry. Uh, I think what we came up with was with the first sentence with the pro and con arguments. We were talking about how of course, you mentioned that they're valid. They make sense, right? With an argument, there's always going to be like a yes and a no to it. But with the, the erasure of nuance, we were talking about how situation matters. So, for example, you could be arguing about X, but when it applies to, like, for example, situation one, maybe X wouldn't really apply well. But if you apply it to a separate situation, the argument could work really well and be, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, it was really hard to explain my thought process, but it was a lot of talking about like situations and how in some situations things are better than others. I actually think you explained it really well, Tuan. Um, I always think of minimum wage when I think of this erase nuance, negate the local in particular. For example, if you live in some places in the South, or you know, like some smaller towns and, and you earn $15 an hour, you might actually be able to live on that. But if you live in San Diego or um, LA, it, just rent alone would be more than working 40 hours at $15 an hour. And so uh, It's that situational thing. And so we should look at nuances. We should look at situations. We should look at local in particular. And, and then, you know, like the, the last part of this um, quotation is very much um, the purpose of having an argument. You might change your mind, learn something new, solve a problem. If you only have this or that, 
um, argumentation becomes very shallow because you don't dig in deep and you're not listening to people either. Um, Twan, did your group discuss um, how to avoid this shallow argumentation, um, strategies for doing that? I don't think so, but my memory is a bit hazy. That's okay. Uh, it just anybody. How can we avoid making argumentation a shallow process? Anybody? By making sure we're fully informed on the issue before we start to speak on it. Yeah. Um, and that would require doing a lot of research. That would be require listening to different perspectives, exploring the reasons for those perspectives. Um, it really is listening and research. So this one, um, group six, rather than have an either or proposition, argument is multiple and complex. Um, what? Who's group six? Do you remember? Okay, group six is either absent or does not remember. Um, so anybody, why is it in, why is this complex, logical, rational um, argumentation that considers multiple vantage points. Why is that an important notion in a culture that values democracy and equity? Anybody? I feel like harking back to what I was talking about with our prompt, like the situationality. With democracy, of course, everybody gets a voice, right? And of course, in our society today, a lot of people have different living situations. So because of that, their situations are of course different. So the issues that might apply to like the upper echelons of society won't trickle down very well to like the lower bounds. So when talking about having like a logical, rational argument, you have to consider like the, the living spaces and just the general worldviews of everybody involved and it can't really focus on like one side of an argument. So that's how I see it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, can anybody add to what Tuan shared? Um, I can speak on um, like democracy kind of the idea behind it is that all the sides come together and then like argue it out to compromise on something. So instead of having one side win or the other, it's like a mix of both of them. So it's at least some of the things you want on each side get done. And having either or arguments make that not possible because it gets rid of the middle area. Yeah, I think, I think those ideas are really important. Group seven. Oh, this is the same. Oh no, it's... Um, if it's sort of the same. Who's, uh, Derek, go, go ahead. Yeah, so um, on the idea of um, like equality, if we're thinking of it in terms of equality is equal value across the board, I feel that you have to have um, a similar principle applied. So you have to have an equal ratio of logic, rationality, emotion, um, concession, and all of those key parts of an argument. You have to have an equal value of that if you want to achieve the goal of like equality. Yeah, and equity is a little different than equality. Equality is everybody gets the same thing or um, everybody's equal. Equity is about seeing that perhaps somebody has a, a disadvantage that 
um, prevents them from having the same opportunities. Um, Whoops, read it wrong, sorry about that. No, 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 that's okay. They're similar ideas. I, I remember seeing um, this idea of equity as, you know, like all the privileges we have. Uh, for example, I grew up speaking standard American English in my home. Um, if, I, if I veered off grammatically at any point, my mom or dad would correct me. And so I have this internal grammar monitor in my head. It's no wonder I became an English teacher, although none of my siblings did. So, you know, I don't know what. At any rate, that's not the point. My point is not everybody has that. So when I got into school, I had this privilege of already having an internal grammar monitor, but not all students had that. So equity gives them time to catch up or considers that maybe perhaps different grammars also have value and not just the one that privileges me. And so um, I want you to, um, I'm gonna put you in groups again and I want you to answer this question. Why does this discussion of argumentation that looks at different perspectives, different vantage points, isn't yes or no, isn't about bashing another side. Why is this important when you're approaching a research project that requires you to create and add to the discussion with your own argument? So let me do this. Um, I've got a copy of the slide that you can use. Um, and um, where are we? Let me put this in the chat and so that you have access to this. Those are the slideshows. Um, answer that question. Why is this important? Let me put you into groups. Uh, Let's do seven groups, three to four of you. Introduce yourselves if you don't know each other and then just, I'll give you maybe two and a half minutes to do this because this is pretty quick, okay? So, um, David, why does this matter as you begin with a research project like the one we're doing? Well, um, basically what our, my group was talking about was that, that um, it matters because when you're, when you're doing a research project, you're approaching it in, in more of a um, objective way, trying to look at other viewpoints and making your argument stronger by considering those different viewpoints. And we just think that, um, you know, completely just bashing the other side is not very, um, it's not a very strong argument because that's more pathos driven when, if you want to make a legit argument, you need to know your facts and back it up, you know, it's kind of what we were talking about. Yeah, I like that idea, David. I think that that's really, really valuable. I, I remember that Baron and, and Grimm actually have a pathos argument, but again, they're considering multiple vantage points and they're not bashing the other side. Um, so, so you can see that you can see their passion while at the same time seeing their logic. Um, did anybody have anything else they wanted to add what David's, to what David said? Um, I know like in the article it's saying um, like don't create your argument like war. So I think you're trying to get us to 
invite all arguments not like that. Invite it, including all of the sides. So kind of just telling us, don't go down that route with just two binary options. Yeah, um, there isn't. A, I, you're you're going to read some things, um, even some things in a text that you. Um, even some of the texts that you're going to read now, you're going to say, well, this writing center or writing centers in general or the university in general is just terrible at, um, at, I don't know, um, <laughs> this just terrible at uh, diversity or multiculturalism or, you know, like they're all, it's systemic racism. And it may have elements of systemic racism, but we want to understand what it is, how it is, how it's changing, ways that it can change, um, ways it's rejecting colorblindness, ways that colorblindness still exists. It isn't colorblindness, no colorblindness. There is complexity in this idea. Um, by the way, I want to um, make sure that you have a copy of Baron and Grimm with you. Um, if you don't, let me stop share and let me go ahead and put that in the window uh, in the chat so you have access to Baron and Grimm if you don't already have it with you. Um, because the rest of the time, we're going to talk about what they say. Um, as I read over your papers, and I think I no, I'm done. I'm done reading the reading journals here. I noticed that sometimes you're missing the overall argument, or you're missing what they're doing to build that argument. You're describing things they're doing, but you're not focusing on how they build the argument. What are the most essential elements? And in a research paper that asks you to show how a claim is developed, you're gonna need to be able to do that. Um, you're also, a lot of you are missing the project, what they're setting out to do in this paper. And that's also important as you start moving into your research, because if you, do the research and you're trying to listen to the various perspectives, but ultimately you end up not, um, you end up not understanding what you've read, you can misrepresent that. And remarkably, I will catch that. And so you don't want that. Um, here's, here's one thing that I do in order to catch the main argument. And I want you to talk about in your groups, don't try and write on the slideshow. Um, you actually will be able to do that. And if you do that, you're gonna mess everybody up because they're gonna see it. But just take some notes on a piece of paper and kind of decipher what are Barone and Grimm doing at, in the first paragraph. I, I'll just tell you, I, they're providing their background and they're describing their various ethnic backgrounds in order to demonstrate the perspective that they're coming from. They're identifying their biases. And um, so that's what they're doing in their first background. They describe their ethnic background in order to show their perspectives on diversity education that might come from their experiences. I want you to think about what are they doing in each of these sections? Um, a Story to Begin by Nancy Barron. This is where she talks about the Writing Center coach. Starting at the bottom of page 58, when they begin speaking together to page 62. And then what are they doing in the rest of the essay? Don't tell me their claims, tell me what they're doing. Use verbs like describes, compares, contrasts, um, identifies. 
Um, and then what does Baron do in the last section? Um, it might even be good if you've got a printed copy of this article um, for you to take some notes on that, okay? So I'm gonna send you back to your rooms. Yeah, I always, I always think that sounds funny. I'm gonna send you back to your rooms for about four minutes for you to develop these ideas, okay? Questions before you go? Okay. So, um, Kyle, what are they doing in that section, um, a story to begin? What is Nancy Baron doing there? Um, Nancy Barone and Grimm in like that first paragraph, the story to begin. No, uh, not, uh, not the first paragraph, but you know, like where she starts during an unexpected free moment. Oh, uh, here, hold up. Um, could you get back to me? Yes, I can. Um, how about Amaru? What are they doing in that section? They're talking about the one where she says the story to begin, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought in that one, she's, they were kind of establishing the need for their arguments. Um, her story to begin shares that there is racism in the writing center and that this is something that should be addressed and that we need to be discussing. So this kind of like sets, um, I don't know, it sets up the basis for why they're doing what they're doing and kind of what brought about this um, discussion for them. Yeah, it's a story that describes the need for this kind of discussion. Are they, is that story about the writing coach, is that focused on racism in the writing center or? I guess that was necessarily the writing center, right? Cause there's like a different assignment that she had been given. But I think just generally like um, how this made them question how they included or addressed diversity in their writing center. Cause although like the, maybe the assignments that they were given in class um, were restrictive for these students, there are things that they could have done to the writing center to help um, support them and encourage their voices. Yeah, and, and it's doing something really powerful is it's describing how racism creeps into writing classrooms or describes how an African-American, um, a very educated, very smart, very analytical African-American writing center coach experiences racism in a classroom, um, which definitely establishes the need for this kind of training. Um, did anybody have a unique sentence that communicated that idea that Amaru and I have been um, discussing. Yeah, it's hard to put those things into a single sentence. Um, down at the bottom of page 58, it all the font size changes and it goes from Nancy Baron saying I to um, both Nancy's saying we, um, from experiences like the one shared in this story. What are they doing in that section? Um, Ashley? Um, I think in this section, uh, they're coming together to um, uh, like to put their ideas together and prove their point um, more. They definitely are, but they're doing something very unique there. And if we were describing this to an audience who had never read this, 
we would want to take we would want to take a few minutes to introduce it because this is where we get a lot of citations they're reviewing a lot of research why are they doing that what is their purpose in this section um anna uh, did you have a sentence that you might use to describe this section um i'd say they're discussing the um historical context of the conversation that they're joining here and then describing their methodology of implementing uh, yeah. these discussions into their writing center. Yeah, and that is definitely what they're doing. Um, Andy, would you add anything to that? Um, I did want to note that this is where they first start talking about colorblindness, like that's kind of how they get into this segue. And I also feel like as they move on in that section, they actually kind of specify what they're writing about, like they talk more about the writing center and diversity in the writing center specifically. So I feel like they're kind of moving from I don't know, to like, they're moving into their main point of diversity in the writing center and what they've been doing. So I feel like it also acts as like a transition into like their work and the lessons that they learned, which comes next. Yeah, I, I'm glad you noted that it is this transitional thing. It becomes, goes from a very specific narrative to illustrate a problem. And then they expand to provide background information on that prog problem, which is colorblindness and systemic racism in the university, which is even, which they decide to tackle with diversity training in the writing center. And I think that it's really important to see that their article isn't about colorblindness, although that's Part of it, their article isn't about um, their article isn't about systemic racism in the university, although that's part of the problem. Their article is about the training that they do and what they learned from that training. Um, what do they do in the rest of the essay? Lessons one through four. Um, Annie, what do they do in the rest of the essay? Lessons one through four, what do those parts do? I'm sorry, you said Annie, right? I did. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, I mean, I guess like my thoughts were throughout the rest of the essay, they just kind of establish various ideas about like racism in general, I guess, and like how to address it and then like use different techniques in a writing center to tackle racism? They do actually talk about those things, but that's not the purpose of those things. That's, I think a key idea here would be the title of those names. Sulema, what are they doing? in these sections. I mean, they're doing all the things that Annie said, but that's not the perhaps the most important thing or their purpose. What's the purpose from these sections? Sulema? She's having trouble turning on her mic. Oh, okay, um, thank you. Michaela? Um, Drea? I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, I was distracted right now because something happened. What was the question you posed right now? Because uh, I wasn't here well, for like the last two minutes-ish. The four, the four sections under the, le under the headings lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, lesson four. What are those sections doing?
anybody. What I got from it is um, like telling their own experience and just saying like, we tried this and like, this is the reaction we got. So it's kind of saying their own personal experience with it. And then the four things they got from it. Yeah, it's four lessons they learned. So if the introduction is establishing the reasons why diversity training should happen in the writing center and the presence of systemic racism and their goals of productive diversity and social change, this section is about the lessons they learned from that kind of training. And so we can see that the, this paper itself is about how do you do this? I mean, like, what are the challenges you'll get? How could you do better than us? Um, what does the last section do? Um, Baron does this section all by herself. She says, a story to conclude by Nancy Baron. What is that section doing? Adrian? Can you, can you repeat which section one more time? The very last section. What does Baron do in the section? Page 66 to end titled, A Story to Conclude. Sorry, I'm just going through right now. Anybody? I think it might be an interesting conclusion in the sense that it it's more of a uh, an expansion of the audience in the sense that she's talking about how Although she may have not experienced all of these, um, I guess all of these situations in the writing center, she had the chance to perceive them with her own eyes and take them in from an outsider perspective, which still gave her the same benefit of the doubt, the same lessons that they perceived in the writing center. And it's, it's more of like, even though you may not have felt these kinds of like injustices or changes uh, to perspective that like the, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to find a way to describe um, some of the challenges. I guess that's, that's probably the more proper word. Uh, rather than uh, experiencing the challenges herself, she got to perceive them from an outsider perspective and that gave her the same uh, benefit of the change that they were perceiving in the writing centers when they stepped in. Yeah, that's really complex, Derek. Um, and I think that you're right, but there's, yeah, there's, she tells another story, Baron does. She tells the story about the Anglo writing center coach. That's what they call their tutors. And how he was, he'd come from a background of being a fisherman and he really resented the fact that indigenous fishermen were saying we have the rights to these waters because it would have changed his life. And he turned on her and said, I hate those people. And um, she has an indigenous background. And so what she heard is he hates me. And it was really hard for her. They'd always gotten along. And at this point she feels attacked, Baron does. She's in a position position of authority, but this young man, she feels like he's attacking her. And then she adds that she met him some years later. And they talk very briefly about that event. And he says, I've changed. Now, why does she tell that story? What is her goal in telling that story? Remember, this is a, an article 
challenging writing center directors to do this kinds of change and warning them that it's gonna be challenging. Here's some things you should look forward, look out for. And then she closes with this story. Why close with this story? What I got from this was um, kind of giving it hope to doing this. Cause she said how when I started the diversity training, it didn't really seem like much progress was being made with these coaches. And so she just shut down from hearing this, but it shows that like it from having that training, eventually like it does take in, it just takes a long like time period of continuously talking about it and it will have a good effect, even though it like can't see it right away. Yeah, that's, that is what they're doing right there. And you can see by breaking this down, into what are they doing here? Not so much what they're saying, they're saying really great things, but when you break it down and here are the things they're doing, here's what the bulk of this article is about. It's about what they learned from diversity training. So the introduction introduces a reason for diversity training, the problems of systemic racism, the hope of productive diversity, the hope of social change, the challenges they face, the lessons they learn, and then finally hope. And when you see that, when you break it down to what each section is doing, you can hope to get at the main argument. Let me show you one more slide. And this is where Baron and Grimm, it's at the end of the introduction, before they start their lessons. Here they are, they are announcing what they're going to do. In the remainder of the article, we reflect on our experience of moving in one writing center from a theoretical commitment to productive diversity to actual social change. While we cannot provide a neat five-step process for others to follow, we will structure our discussion around four of the lessons we learned from this experience. In deliberately trying to address race in our training over the last six years, the biggest challenge was accepting that we were a lot further from the goal of productive diversity than we imagined. The personal transformations that productive diversity calls for do not happen easily, nor do they occur by reading a book. Addressing race in a writing center is not a one-time event, but a continual process, one that we remain engaged in today. So their project, what they set out to do is in this article, not in their training, but in this article, what they set out to do is to share what they learned. What is their argument? It's right here. And it's 11.50, so I'm going to let you go, and we will address this again next week. Why? Obviously, you're writing a research paper that's going to be in response to some specific aspect of this article, so it's important that you understand it. But the bigger picture is the things you learn in analyzing the structure and the meaning of this article are strategies you're going to use when you're doing your research and understanding those, but also the kind of work you're gonna to have to do outside of this class when you're analyzing these types of texts. So I'm done, I'll stick around for a little bit if you want to, but otherwise have a great rest of your week and a wonderful week weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Quick question if possible.